Welcome to the Prime Strength YouTube channel. As always, Brendan T. Toner and head coach here at Prime Strength. Guys, today we got another training vlog. If you're new here, I'm filming all my training workouts into my meet on October 2nd. So we got a lower body hypertrophy day here. We got high rep, high bar squat sets of nine, followed by some sets of 10 on Romanian deadlift, a bunch of accessory work and some ab work. And in today's video, I want to talk about a few topics. The first one is going to be why you shouldn't treat every rep like a one rep max when you're doing high volume squat or deadlift work. The second topic I want to touch on is uh, spot reduction. So a lot of people notice my comment in one of my other videos that spot reduction is being shown in the scientific literature to actually be possible. And I want to talk about one, the science literature that uh, showcased spot reduction wasn't possible. It's not as strong as people thought it was. And then I want to talk about the new study that came out a few years ago that showed spot reduction to be uh, very plausible in modest amount. So we'll be talking about all of this. Uh, warming up here, doing some hip airplanes, trying to get my hips a little bit more open and stable. Um, this is just a really good way of getting your external rotation down and getting a little bit more balanced and stable before you squat. And then I just hop right into my squat. So here's kind of my first like ascending working set. So we have ascending sets of nine on high bar squat. This is 330 pounds. And I was actually moving here a little slower than I wanted to. Now, normally on high rep squats, if you treat every rep like a one rep max, where you catch a humongous breath and brace, which is what you should be doing on a one rep max, and you get so tight and move so with so much tension, you're gonna gas out and actually make the set harder than needed. When you're working with intensities that are a lot lighter, especially if you're nowhere near failure, you do not need that kind of tension or bracing. It is unnecessary. It will not help you move the load any better per se. And what will happen, like look at these reps. You see how I kind of just go down and I haven't even fully caught a, a breath. But do you see me moving out of position in any way, shape or form? Is there any breakdown in consistency? Are my knees caving in? Is my brace going away? Is my back losing position? No. Now, if I were to do this a lot slower with huge bracing, like I would do on a one rep max, if you guys have seen my squat every day videos, you'll know when I do a one rep max, I catch a humongous deep uh, kind of diaphragmic breath. No way I could do that on sets of nine without actually tiring myself out more. So I purposely move with a pace when I do higher rep squats. Now I will say if you're a beginner or an early intermediate, I think you should probably treat every rep like a one rep max because the truth is, you will not be able to do what I do on a one rep max and it won't gas you out and that will actually ensure you have good consistent form because you being able to move uh, like how you do with a one rep max is gonna be a lot different than someone who's been power lifting and lifting for 10 years and, and has a lot more experience. Now outside of that realm with our lifters that are a lot more higher in the intermediate phase or even advanced phase, I actually recommend that they move with more of a pace. They still have to have good form and you have to use this in the right way, but usually sets of eight or higher, especially if it's not near failure, I'm not gonna do that. If I am going to failure, I'm probably gonna actually control it a little bit more, but it's still gonna probably be a quicker pace than say doing a one rep max. Now, moving on to some RDLs here, had ascending sets of 10 here also, really working on my hip hinge. Now, what I want you guys to see is how I brace for these. So watch this set. I'm gonna stand tall, extend, breathe ribs down, huge breath in, and then I hinge. So I'm creating symmetry from interior to posterior. I'm getting a lot of trunk extension when I first walk it out. I try to almost arch my back, hit the damn rack there. Uh, and then from there, I breathe and exhale out and squeeze my upper abdominals and just abdominal cavity as a whole on. And that creates flexion demand. So I create extension demand, flexion demand, and then from there I brace. And so I'm trying to create symmetry. So look in slow motion, arching the back, very tall chest, overextended. We don't want to actually do that. So then I breathe out and get those ribs down a little too much and I kind of caught that. So I reoriented and as I was breathing in, I create a little bit more symmetry. So you see how there's a perfect balance there of ab flexion tension and then back extension tension and both of them meet in the middle creating symmetry and rigidity. So whenever you're bracing, this is hugely important and we have a ton of videos about this actually on our Prime Strength website. So prime-strength.com, if you guys wanna sign up for one of our group programs, we have so many videos that cover bracing, that cover setup, that cover just tips in general. Ooh, guys, I'm looking kind of juicy on these, these leg extensions here. Um, yo, by the way, this rogue leg extension is one of the best 
uh, like free weight leg extensions I've ever felt. Normally these feel like trash and I only like machine leg extensions in leg curls, but the way they designed the resistance curve here is actually so nice. It really feels good at the top. You can get a nice squeeze. It doesn't feel like there's no tension at the bottom and then all the tension at the top. It's a much smoother uh, resistance curve by the way they, they set up the uh, biomechanics or, or rather, excuse me, the physics of how this apparatus uh, rotates through space. So it's really, really cool. But anyway, back to what I was saying, we have a ton of videos on our website and I'll actually show some of that on the screen. I want you guys, if you're interested in, in group coaching, not only are you getting access to our group programs, but you get access to videos like this that I'm showing here on the screen. This is one of the videos I recorded today for our group coaching members about how to properly get the most out of pause deadlifts. And I go over a bunch of tips and every other video you're seeing pop up on the screen are, are videos that are behind our uh, website password. So all you gotta do is sign up for one of our very affordable group coaching programs and get access to all that. Now, spot reduction is possible. My abs have never been this lean in my life at this body fat level. My legs are looking fat as hell. Back in the day, in 2015, when I was actually a little bit leaner than I currently am, or right around the same body fat level, my legs were striated and my abs still had a lot of fat on them. This cut, I decided to, to try to spot reduce. And the thing to understand here is that spot reduction is actually possible, and this is shown in the scientific data. Now, it's only gonna happen to very modest amounts. It's not like you can just outright completely change your body fat distribution, but you can change it to an extent. Now, Ironically, most people who, who continue to parrot the line that, oh, hey, spot reduction is not possible, you know, there's data that shows it, most of them haven't actually read the data that supposedly disproves the idea of spot reduction. In fact, the data is mainly on things like tennis players and shot putters, where they look at one arm and compare it to the other and try to see if there's a difference in fat levels. There's no dietary control, there's nothing with a caloric deficit there. They just basically compare someone who uses one arm more than the other and then claim that spot reduction isn't possible because they didn't see it there. Now there have been a few trials, but the trials where they tried to implement spot reduction in the past were really shoddy. They did not have a few factors included into these trials, namely a controlled dietary deficit between all the groups, as well as cardio implementation, which is very important. I will see if I can find a full access paper that everyone can find without an access code to an online medical journal. If I can't find that, I'll have to just post uh, the partial study. But keep in mind, this is how I know a lot of people who claim to read scientific data don't actually read it because they don't have access codes to these online medical journals. But that's a whole rant for another time. Uh, in my opinion, according to the scientific data, I believe spot reduction is possible in very modest amounts. And I believe it is something that I incited my, I, I don't believe, I know I incited this on myself and I have done this with athletes in the past. Anyway, that's the video guys. Uh, if you liked it, you know, thumbs it up, go check out our group coaching videos, leave a comment section or leave a comment down in this section below. I cannot speak and I'll catch you guys in the next one.